from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Lyft turns its first ever adjusted profit, a milestone for the ride hailer that's been losing money since its founding. Uber has also promised to hit profitability this year, but can they both get back to grow now that mask mandates are back? Plus, after a sweeping crackdown on China's most powerful technology companies, Tencent now feeling the heat. Chinese state media calling video games, quote, spiritual opium, prompting the company to weigh a ban on kids. What this could mean for China's biggest corporation. And SEC Chair Gary Gensler finally weighs in on the crypto craze. In his first extensive interview about the blockchain and Bitcoin, he calls on Congress to rein in what he dubs the Wild West, and Bitcoin drops yet again. We'll get to that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets with Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta. And I want to start, Kriti, with Lyft delivering its first ever adjusted profit in the second quarter. Lyft had been saying quarter after quarter that this was coming this year, and now they've done it. Absolutely. And one quarter before they said they would do it, you can see that really just becoming a game changer in after hours trading. Look at this lift shares up over 4%. And you really hit it, Emily. This is a profit story for a company that has just been bleeding cash really since its founding. So a great turnaround story. Once again, this due to cost cutting from the management perspective, but also that surging demand you're seeing for ride hailing. Once again, shares up 4% after hours. I want to take you to another earnings story, though, because we also got results from Activision Blizzard shares up about 4% to profit approximately after hours as well. Intraday though, Emily, this was a stock that was very affected by kind of that Chinese regulatory scrutiny on video gaming companies. We'll talk about that later in the show, but this is really key here because now you're seeing it very closely affected to its earnings beat. Now saying that not only did it beat its quarter, quarterly results, excuse me, but also its outlook for the entire year. And of course the company is dealing uh, with some kind of lawsuit cases and of course sexual harassment claims as well. But from a investment point of view solely, this was good news for the shares. I also want to bring in a non earning story because this is going to be very crucial for the semiconductor index. We know this in particular that uh, Nvidia has been leading the chips higher of a lot of that has been anticipation of getting approval from the UK in that arm deal today. UK regulators saying well they might not get it citing national security concerns. So you did see a little bit of a hit intraday for Nvidia but eventually coming back up and ending 0.3% on the day higher. But AMD is the one that really profited from that news closing at a record high Emily for the fifth straight day. Once again, those competitors really battling it out right now when it comes to share price. Interesting. All right, Kriti Gupta, thanks so much for that roundup. Uh, I want to get to more on Tencent now. Chinese state-run media branding video games as spiritual opium and electronic drugs. That comment stoking fears that online entertainment is Beijing's next target. I want to bring in Bloomberg Sherry Ann, who's been following the developments here. And how is Tencent responding to this new pressure, new commentary from the Chinese government. Yeah, I mean, they've been pressured now for a while, whether it's an antitrust crackdown or gaming addiction uh, that started back in 2018. They already had measures in place, but Emily, they are now pledging more further measures to rein in playtime for minors. We're talking about only one hour of gaming allowed for uh, kids uh, during the weekdays, two hours during the weekends and holidays, also perhaps banning those in-app purchases uh, by kids under 12 years old, even floating the idea of completely banning gaming for children under 12 years old. But as I said, this is on top of measures that already came back in 2018, 2019, when they were in the crossfires of another clampdown by Beijing. Now Beijing saying uh, through the Economic Information Daily, which is a state-owned media, that as you said, those very strong words, electronics, drugs, opium, uh, saying that you cannot uh, an industry should prosper by eradicating an entire generation. So uh, Tencent, not surprising, uh, this GTV chart showing that they're furthest from the 12-month target price on record. And of course, we saw other Chinese gaming stocks here in the U.S. plunging as well. Meantime, this crackdown also taking a toll on Alibaba. We saw the company reporting results. 
not too pretty. What do you see in there? Yeah, and we were watching Alibaba so closely because it was one of the first companies that were actually hit uh, by Chinese uh, authorities cracking down on the tech sector. Their first quarter revenue actually missing Wall Street estimates for the first time in two years. Revenue climbing above $31 billion, but still coming in short of estimates. And net income did rebound from the previous quarter. But remember, the previous quarter they had a loss because they were hit with that record $2.8 billion antitrust fine. So... Alibaba has been underperforming uh, peers. This GTV chart on the Bloomberg showing their underperformance since uh, that Ant IPO was scrapped. Ant's profit also falling in the latest quarter to $2.1 billion. Alibaba's major divisions from cloud to e-commerce all showing the growth slowed. Still interestingly, or perhaps because of the regulatory crackdown, CEO Daniel Zhang endorsing uh, government policies, especially when it comes to uh, the government calling out the blocking of rival services because, of course, Alibaba and Tencent exclude each other's services from their platforms, but now he's calling this a positive trend. Meantime, Sherry, it feels like no sector is safe. Car chip makers are also under investigation. What's happening there? Yeah, I mean, we heard from authorities that they're looking into price collusion, and we saw auto chip makers in China fall uh, by the daily limit in Shanghai. And our Bloomberg columnist, Shuli Ren, now saying that perhaps, you know, just stay away from the hot money, where the hot money is going. Because, of course, this was a sector that was surging given the global chip shortage uh, ongoing for the past year. And it's been a similar story for Tencent. Despite all of these clampdowns, we continue to see liquidity investment continuing to flow. We saw investments continuing to flow to education, property management sectors, and now they're uh, uh, really taking the heat from Beijing. Aging. Okay, Sherryanne Co-anchor of uh, Bloomberg Daybreak Australia and Daybreak Asia. I know you're going to continue covering this throughout the day. Thanks so much, Sherry, for your analysis there. I want to stick with chips. NVIDIA, the biggest U.S. chip company, has announced a $40 billion deal to buy ARM. They announced that back in September, but the U.K. is now considering blocking the deal due to potential risks to national security. No final decision made yet. Bloomberg Tech's Ian King joins us now with more. So, Ian, what do you make of the mention of national security risks here? Yeah, I mean, what we first have to point out here, Emily, is that this is Bloomberg's reporting. The U.K. government hasn't actually said anything yet. Um, but to take, to take you back to the conversations you and I had when this was first announced, you remember we said that, you know, the, the sticking point for a lot of people was how would something like this make its way through a, a very difficult regulatory environment, particularly when arms value is its independence. It, as you know, works with so many other com companies and supplies competitors that, you know, it, its value is its independence. So how could it then end up in the arms of just one company? And that was considered to be the big sticking point. And I think what we've reported today is an example of just how difficult a process it's likely to be. All right, incredible scoop by you. What does this mean for NVIDIA? How big a blow could this be if it doesn't happen? Yeah, I mean, to be, you know, back to the I think central point, I think quite a lot of analysts are like, this is very much a, a huge bonus. And this is certainly something that, you know, Jensen Wang's next big expansion for a company that's really done well, it would be fantastic. But there's been kind of a lot of cynicism or a lot of doubts about this built in probably doesn't destroy or seriously undermine the NVIDIA story for a lot of investors at this point. But it's definitely a hangover. It's definitely something I think that they would like to see clarity on. And is it a boost for NVIDIA's competition? We saw AMD shares rise. What does this mean for the broader landscape? Yeah, no, that, that, that's the very good question. I mean, we've already seen very large publicly traded companies that are customers of ARM come out and say, we don't want this to happen. We think this is a bad idea. So, you know, whether you're Qualcomm, whether you're Intel, whether you're AMD, you really don't want to see NVIDIA get any stronger. NVIDIA has been doing really well, particularly lately in the data center, which is a very important market for AMD and, and, and Intel. So anything which kind of holds up the, the, the Jensen Wang charge uh, is got to be good for them. All right, Ian King, we'll continue to watch your reporting on this, see if we get any official word from the U.K. government. Thanks so much.
for that story. Meantime, another one we're continuing to watch. Microsoft joining the list of big tech corporations that will mandate vaccines before employees can enter any office in the United States. The new rule starts in September, but the software and cloud giant won't fully reopen work sites until October. Alphabet and Facebook also recently announced employees must be vaccinated to return to U.S. offices as well. Coming up, SEC Chair Gary Gensler cheer gearing up for more oversight of the crypto industry. We're going to have the latest on what regulation could come next. This is Bloomberg. Regulation is coming to the, quote, Wild West that is crypto, if the words of SEC Chair Gary Gensler are any indication. As policymakers have struggled to respond to the largely unregulated market, Chairman Gensler has signaled protecting investors is one of his top priorities. Take a listen. Right now, though, in this digital scarce speculative asset, Bitcoin and others, we just don't have enough investor protection. And frankly, at this time, it's more like the Wild West than some sort of uh, protection against fraud and manipulation in the space. This asset class is rife with fraud, scams, and abuses in certain applications. That was SEC Chair Gensler speaking at the 2021 Aspen Security Forum in his most extensive interview yet on crypto. Joining me for more on what's ahead for investors and the rapidly growing community of crypto adopters is our Bloomberg News financial regulation reporter, Ben Bain in Washington. So, Ben, we don't have to read between the lines so much anymore. Gary Gensler getting more explicit. What do you think this signals in terms of real regulation coming for this industry and, and what it will mean for investors? Yeah, we, we, we had a pretty long conversation with Chair Gensler about his thoughts. Um, the really interesting thing here is he spent three years or so teaching classes at MIT about cryptocurrencies, blockchain technology. So he really has thought a lot about this space, this technology. And what we heard from him um, very specifically was that while he has an affinity towards the technology and, and he thinks there's a lot of potential there and, and he's very interested in it, He's really focused on investor protection when it comes to cryptocurrencies, and he thinks there are a lot of gaps. So when you talk about what might be coming here, one thing he pointed to specifically was the crypto exchanges and also decentralized financial platforms where some cryptocurrencies trade or are lended out. You know, he really said that maybe even Congress needs to step in here passed some laws that would give the SEC and other agencies potentially some more authority. Um, he said right now there's at least seven different initiatives over at the SEC where they're looking at really everything across the board from how crypto assets uh, are dealt with in terms of custody by broker dealers all the way to whether there should be an, a Bitcoin ETF at some point and really everything in between. So I think we can expect a pretty comprehensive regulatory uh, you know, framework here from, from this new SEC chair. More here from Gensler himself. He says, I've asked the staff of the SEC to use all of our authorities anywhere we can to uncover any wrongdoing to those currently mm -hmm. or considering investing in crypto. Please remember, not only are they a highly speculative asset class, but there are also significant gaps in the investor protection afforded to you. How are crypto enthusiasts, and you know, they're not all enthusiasts. Some of these folks are just, you know, regular investors who are dipping a toe into the crypto market. How are they responding? Well, I think for some, for kind of the crypto enthusiasts, if you want to, if you want, if we want to call them that, coming in when they saw that that Gary Gensler was going to be the SEC chair, they were pretty excited. I mean, here was this guy who had taught a class on this, spent a lot of time thinking about it, and there was an expectation that perhaps he was going to move quickly to open things up, to kind of bring crypto into the mainstream in, in a way that maybe it hadn't been previously here in the United States. What we're hearing now, though, is that that's going to come with some strings. If crypto is going to go mainstream, be it through a Bitcoin ETF or be it through some of these other mechanisms, he wants to see more control. He wants to see more investor protections. And I think the response right now really depends on where, you're sit, where you sit. If you're one of the people who looks at crypto and thinks this is a way for a, a, a store of money, um, something that can really exist outside of 
government, essentially the kind of initial libertarian streak of, of all this, you're not real happy. You're actually pretty upset about what you're hearing. But if you're someone who thinks this is a really interesting technology with lots of potentials to find new efficiencies and, and could really be brought into the mainstream, I think a lot of people have just wanted that clarity. And they're probably liking what they're hearing here. Obviously, it's going to depend on how it's all implemented. But it really depends on what you what you want to see crypto be. Do you want it to see to be something that's outside of, of government control, or do you want to see it go mainstream into into finance? And and that's obviously, I think, where where Chair Gensler wants to see it go. Right, and it, it is going more mainstream as we sure. speak, regulation or not. Ben Bain, Bloomberg News financial regulation reporter. Thanks so much for weighing in on that. I appreciate your insights there. Coming up, Square's massive acquisition of Afterpay, shaking up the buy now, pay later industry, where Klarna is, an, Klarna is another rising player. Klarna CEO Sebastian Simiakowski with us next to talk about the new competitive landscape. That's coming up. This is Bloomberg. The buy now, pay later business has a big new kid on the block. Square's $29 billion bet on Afterpay is shaking up the ever-evolving credit landscape. Just one example of how quickly the banking industry is changing. Joining me now for his thoughts on the acquisition is Klarna co-founder and CEO Sebastian Semiakowski. Klarna, of course, competes with Afterpay. So this is a big move. As a competitor, Sebastian, what do you make of it? Well, yeah, it's it's definitely a big move, quite interesting, obviously, to follow. But it's directionally speaking, what we've been, you know, believing to happen for a long period of time is that, as you just mentioned, we're seeing a massive transformation of retail banking. It reminds me a lot of what I saw e-commerce and retail do 10 years ago. And, you know, there's going to be three three areas of big players, right? The tech companies, fintech, and some old banks will try to reinvent themselves in this transformation. And so from that perspective, it makes sense. What surprises me slightly is, though, that, you know, currently in the U.S., there's a massive momentum for buy now, pay later. Take Klarna's example, we're getting close to 20 million users, growing at, you know, 400% rate. Um, and so just surprised to see what might be a distraction for one of the largest players over the next year at a very, very critical point of time when all of us are trying to, you know, uh, shape up and change this market in the U.S. So have you gotten more M&A interest in the last 24 to 48 hours as a result of this? I mean, we had an analyst on the show yesterday who said Klarna could be a target. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, we think more about, like, what are our targets? Uh, we thought about PayPal, but it looked slightly overpriced at the time. So, well, we'll see. You have bought, I, I believe, three companies just in the last month yourself. I mean, there are folks out there who think that buy now, pay later is just a feature of a bigger fintech company. How do you respond to that? No, I, I, I think that's true. And that's if you look at what Klarna does, for example, most people in the US may not be familiar with that. But we offer, for example, we have our own plastic card. We've issued over half a million cards in, in Europe. We offer deposit accounts, banking services and so forth. So we have basically all of the features that you expect from the neobanks, uh, not all of them launched in the US just yet, but we see the market in a very similar way. Buy now, pay later to us is a feature. And what Klarna tries to do for merchants and consumers goes far beyond it. But it's a fantastic feature as it unlock the market. And it also spells much better future for consumers because it is you know, free for consumers. It only charge merchants. It doesn't have all of the poor aspects of the traditional credit card industry, which is really, really bad in how it you know, tries to put you into debt, tries to uh, charge you overdraft fees and push you into revolving and so forth. So it's a better, less predatory model that is much more consumer friendly. Now, this is a space that Apple is getting into with Goldman Sachs. Of course, PayPal is in there. Now you have Square buying Afterpay. There is a firm. I mean, how does this change the competitive landscape for you? Is this a competitive threat? Well, I think, again, as I said, I think that like, um, my expectancy is that, you know, we're going to have two companies that's going to spend a lot of time now figuring out how they're going to work together. And I think to us, that's rather an opportunity than anything else. When it comes to the big players, um, I'm not a, you know, I, I think to some degree we're seeing uh, the traditional tech giants in Silicon Valley overstretching. They think they can do everything. I think it's possible to be good at 
some stuff or excellent at some stuff, but very hard to be good at everything. And we see massive potential. And you know, we're we're um, you know neighbors here, not to another company, Spotify, that wasn't supposed to exist due to iTunes and Apple Music, and is thriving and doing really well. And so we hope to be able to replicate that in the banking services in the U.S. So I guess the question is being asked, does a company like Klarna make more sense as part of a bigger financial institution, or are you aspiring to be that bigger financial institution yourself? Um, I would say definitely the latter. I mean, I've been at it for 16 years, right? And we've had a fantastic uh, journey so far, but we really feel like we're at the beginning of it. We're been very lucky to strike partnership with Sequoia and have Michael Moritz on our board support us for the last decade. And I think when me and Michael uh, look at the future, we feel very, very excited about the next 10 years. Because again, this is the this is not the end. This is really the beginning of the transformation of retail banking. Uh, you know, all that you can see all the trends, it's all happening, but it's still early days. And so similar to you know asking Amazon 10 years ago, would they sell? I think, you know. Why would they? And why would we? This is just the beginning. All right. Uh, I remember you using that Amazon metaphor before. So we will keep watching. Sebastian Simiatkowski, always good to have you here. Klarna co-founder and CEO. Thanks for stopping by. Some other stories we are watching. A coalition of gig economy companies like Uber and Lyft is opening up a new front in the struggle over the legality of their business model. The companies want to place a measure on next year's Massachusetts ballot that would classify their workers as independent contractors, not employees. The Massachusetts Attorney General contends that Uber and Lyft drivers should be considered employees, setting up a showdown like we saw with Prop 22 in California. And sticking with big tech employee rights, a labor union may get the chance to reverse its loss to Amazon. Bloomberg has learned that a federal official has recommended overturning the results of a union election at an Amazon warehouse in Alabama. The National Labor Relations Board hearing officer says the election should be run again. Amazon can appeal this decision. The union accused the company of making anti-union threats and skewing the final vote. Coming up, Match Group out with their latest results. We're going to be speaking with the CFO and COO, Gary Swidler. It's coming up. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. I want to bring it now to our Bloomberg Markets reporter, Kriti Gupta, for the latest. And Kriti, got to talk about Robinhood way up after that muted debut and unclear why, it seems. What are you seeing here? Well, you know, it wasn't too long ago when we had written this off as a flopped IPO, but it makes a comeback 24%. That's how much it surged today. And here's why. It's all about retail traders, the power behind the stock. Our colleague Bailey Lipschultz reporting. It was the top trade on Fidelity today with over 9,000 buy orders. You can see the impact right here, Emily. A 24% surge actually going past its IPO price of $38. But it's not the only story I want to show you today because you had a slew of earnings as well when it comes to the market. Markets, that Chinese regulatory scrutiny just isn't going away. And I want to start with the top because this was the very first place that you really saw the market impact of it. Alibaba reporting earnings missing for the first time in two years. It's all about that China crackdown. You're starting to see it really affect their cloud businesses, their e-commerce businesses, which brings me to the latest development in that story. And that is, of course, the video game stocks. I really want to mention quickly that, of course, Tencent was down today and really seeping into other U.S. video game stocks here. Earning stories here in terms of stateside stories. Let's start with Lyft. 
great news after hours for Lyft in particular coming out and reporting their first quarterly adjusted profit after bleeding cash since its founding. And of course, this was a quarter earlier than expected. So those shares really surging once again on that uh, demand as well as cost cutting measures. And I want to end with a, a kind of a downer story for Match Group, at least for now in terms of after hours reporting. You are seeing shares down 4%. They reported great earnings, really talking about that momentum, but it's all about the Delta variant. What impact could it have on that progress moving forward? All right, Critty, thanks for wrapping that up for us. Appreciate it. Dating apps hitting record numbers in July with pandemic restrictions lifting, but can that momentum continue? For more, I want to bring in Match Group's earnings report and speak with Match CFO and COO Gary Swidler. So look, Gary, the results were good. What are the late pandemic behaviors, dating behaviors that you're seeing that are driving this? Well, actually, we think the results were great, and people are out there dating again, um, and our results show that. We've seen real momentum through May and June, especially in the U.S., as uh, we saw a really strong recovery and reopening. We're seeing that go through the U.K. and other parts of Europe now. Um, Asia's a little further behind, but it should come online as vaccine rates uh, go up. So we think there's a lot of room to run here as the world continues to recover. Right, but there are new mask mandates now in place as of the last 24 hours here in California and across the country. And of course, the Delta variant is continuing to spread. Are you seeing engagement dropping at all as a result of this? No, we really aren't. Our engagement remains really strong. It's higher than it was uh, pre-pandemic. It's harder for people to meet um, in real life because workplaces and schools still haven't really fully reopened. So people are using online tools to meet friends and people to date. Um, and that's going to continue. And now people have the option to go out and meet in real life as well. So they can meet first online. And if they like the person, they can go and meet them in real life. So the reopenings are definitely helping us. Um, and I think we're going to continue to see people want to go out and meet people, just given that they've been locked down for a long time. Um, so as long as we don't see the real restrictions on movement that we saw at the very beginning of the pandemic, I think we'll see tailwinds in our business. Uh, mask mandates, I think people are able to work around those, especially in the warmer months, people will meet outside. People have been very resilient. You know, the last thing people wanna do is stop meeting people um, and be by themselves. So they're gonna keep turning to our products to meet people, whether that's virtual or in real life. I know vaccination status has been really important to enable folks to say whether or not they are vaccinated. Do you find that people are actually being transparent about their, their vaccination status and how's that playing out? Yeah, I mean, I think it's become a critical factor um, in people wanting to meet and date people uh, via our services that they wanna know if people are vaccinated and people are putting that out there, a vaccine badge, we call it, because they wanna let people know that they're vaccinated and that opens up more people to be interested in them. So it's become kind of a badge of honor. We're seeing a high percentage of people put that credential on their profile and we think that'll continue to increase and people are looking for that and so it's just a helpful fact like many other helpful profile pieces of information um, the fact that you're vaccinated is is attracting others to you and we think that's a great thing meantime obviously the olympics are happening and one scam has gotten a lot of attention tinder users changing their location to be in the geographic area of the olympic village trying to meet with olympians and actually matching with them. What's your take on this? Well, you know, the Olympics are always a great time for us. Uh, people from all over gathering uh, in one place. And so although it's been a little tougher this year with COVID, our products are still uh, being used um, for the Olympics and people wanting to match with Olympians. And so um, this is something we see every few years. And, um, you know, we're excited that people find our products something to turn to when the Olympics are going on. Okay, but are you, are you doing anything to try to prevent users from, you know, you know, disguising their location, if you will? Yeah. I mean, is that yeah, something I mean, you want to be to, happening? No, I mean, we all have tools to combat bad behavior and people who shouldn't be doing the things they're doing. So that's one of a, of a list of things that we'll watch for um, as we go forward here. Uh, you also recently acquired HyperConnect, and I know that this opens a ton of new possibilities, you know, whether it's video, audio, virtual reality. Talk to us about what this could mean. Yeah, we're really excited about the HyperConnect acquisition and there's a bunch of different components uh, to it. 
The first is we see a lot of growth opportunities for us in Asia. This gives us another 400 plus people on the ground in Asia. So a big, big team, highly capable team, really strong on the technology side with over 200 engineers and really highly talented advanced engineers. So that's a real shot in the arm for the company. And I think really could be beneficial for us down the road. And they've got a lot of expertise in video, which we talked about before. That's an important part of dating and meeting people online. Now you want to do a video chat with them first. So HyperConnect's really good on the video side. They also have some really good audio technology um, and things that we can import into others of our brand. So we're going to spend a bunch of time with them uh, getting some of their capabilities into our other brands, which we think will pay big dividends for the company. We also think we can help them. They've got two really good apps in Azar, which is a video chat app and Hakuna, which is a live streaming video app. And we can help them grow in Europe, in the US and Japan, where we're really strong. So there's a lot of things we can do with HyperConnect, both to help them grow and for them to help our other apps grow. Um, Me and so Meantime, Bumble, Gary, is opening a cafe in New York to help people meet in person. What do you think about that? Is that something that you think uh, will work or is important or is it something that Match might do? No, it's really not part of our strategy. We're not in the cafe opening business. People have lots of different places to meet once they use our services to meet online. That's really the core bread and butter of what we're good at. And so we're going to stick to using technology to make people have joyous connections and meet people online. And uh, then they'll figure out, I think, where to go from there. So I don't see this uh, entering into the cafe business. All right. Well, we'll be watching how the dating business business continues to evolve as the pandemic evolves. Gary Swidler, Match CFO and COO, appreciate you stopping by. Okay. Coming up, Blue Apron shares down after its second quarter earnings report as customers return to restaurants. But with vaccines slowing and the Delta variant spreading, could that give the meal kit maker a boost? Our conversation with Blue Apron CEO Linda Finley Kozlowski next. This is Bloomberg. Meal Kit subscription service Blue Apron is losing customers as consumers return to restaurants. The company reported its second quarter results this morning with a net loss of 186 million dollars. I want to dig in to Blue Apron's performance and what new programs they have in place. Linda Findley Kozlowski, Blue Apron president and CEO with us now. So Linda, shares opened lower but did recover some, though still closed down. Give us some color on what trends you're seeing here when it comes to customer engagement. Yeah, so actually what we're starting to see is what we would consider to be a normal return to seasonality. And so we usually have a change between Q1 and Q2 going back to pre-pandemic times, um, because Q1 is the largest quarter for meal kit companies. And so you usually see some sort of a drop between Q1 and Q2. So a lot of what we're seeing right now is actually seasonality. On the flip side of that, what we're also seeing is that a lot of the work we've done around product initiatives that have driven revenue per customer, we hit record AOV this quarter and continue to grow that value per customer and um, and sort of um, driving additional dollars from each customer in the base is continuing to grow and actually holding quite steady um, during the pandemic sort of reopening, although all of that is continuing to change right now. So look, we were just talking to the COO of Match earlier where, you know, mask mandates bad for their business. But uh, in the case of Blue Apron, I wonder with new mandates, new restrictions, the Delta variant increasing, could that boost your business in the short term as we continue to struggle to get out of this pandemic? It'll be interesting because we were already seeing um, strong retention of cooking at home, you know, uh, habits and other things as we expected to. Again, we expected to see a dip as things started to open up again, but then we also expected to see it dip to higher levels than what we had seen pre-pandemic because of people forming these habits. And that has continued to hold true and continue to be even more valuable per customer because of these product initiatives um, that people are engaging with on a more and more frequent basis. So that continues to go forward, which means that so far what we've seen is it's stayed fairly steady 
um, as, De as Delta has started becoming more of a conversation. But I do think the next couple of weeks are going to be very interesting because honestly, some of these mass mandates are, are very new to people. And the reactions of individuals is a little different now than it was in the beginning of the actual, you know, the start of the pandemic. And so um, I think the next couple of weeks are going to tell us a lot about what happens to demand across a variety of industries. Yeah, you've been working on add-ons like apps and sides and dessert, butcher bundles. At the same time, when you look at uh, customer trends, I believe you peaked with 1 million customers in 2017, 375,000 last quarter. You know, what do you see as a sort of realistic number where customers will stabilize? Because you obviously have, uh, you know, a ton of loyal customers. How many customers are going to keep coming back quarter after quarter? Well, I think it's a different way to look at it because when you go back to some of those peak customer numbers, that was um, that was early days. And a lot of what's happened in between then is there's been a reset of the business, including, you know, just a prime example, when you go back to 2018, we spent about $117 million in marketing. This is before I joined the company. And then in 2019, went to about $48 million in marketing. So a pretty big change and drop, which was why we had such significant declines in customers and revenue at that time, which was anticipated and planned as the, as the company reset. I still maintain that the meal kit space is very new. I mean, you're seeing increased adoption overall, you're seeing increased interest, understanding the sustainability of meal kits, et cetera. And so now that we're leaning back into marketing and starting to rebuild in a much more sustainable way towards growth and getting to adjusted EBITDA um, positive next year, you know, we can start to layer on top of that and build. But the market opportunity is actually quite large when you think about the broader food industry and trends towards buying food online. Interesting. And I know you also have this Aprons for All initiative focused on sustainable uh, meal kits. You've just done a partnership with Disney. We'll be watching how those play out. Uh, Linda Finley Kozlowski, Blue Apron president and CEO, thanks so much for stopping by. Okay, coming up, the world of venture capital on fire with firms pouring billions into startups. Mark Andreessen, co-founder and general partner at Andreessen Horowitz, talks about the explosion of VC and funding in Silicon Valley next. This is Bloomberg. The golden age for startups. Venture capital is seeing a boom as investments continue pouring in, with startups seeing almost $300 million in funding just in the last six months. Mark Andreessen, co-founder and general partner at Andreessen Horowitz, sits down to discuss all of this on the latest episode of Bloomberg Wealth with David Rubenstein. Two possibilities. <laughs> One possibility is where we've all we've gotten carried away again, uh, so we've gotten ahead, ahead of ourselves again, the same way we did in uh, in the late '90s, um, and um, and, th and things are just are, are too hot, and that's a possibility. Um, the the other possibility is where this is, our society is going through a real technological transformation. And it was already going through a transformation before COVID, and I think there's a good argument that COVID has accelerated that transformation. A lot of digital businesses have really accelerated through COVID, um, and it feels like the world is going to change in some pretty fundamental ways coming out of COVID. And so in that case, you have these new tech companies basically dri driving this change and, and, and realizing the benefits. Do you worry that because the economy might soften at some point if interest rates are raised, or just because of the business cycle, the wonderful world of venture capital will slow down a bit? And is that a worry for you? So it's a cyclical business for sure. It has a history of boom bust cycles, you know, basically just like any other sector of the economy. Um, that said, I guess I would say we, we do not have a great track record in our industry of predicting these cycles. Um, and I think most of what we, I think most of how we either perform or fail to perform is micro, not macro, which, which is to say it's based on the success or failure of individual companies. Um, and, and if you just look at the history of, of, of venture capital and startups, many of the best companies have been formed during the hot periods, but also many of the companies have been formed during the cold periods, right? And they're, they're there are pros and cons to those periods. Um, and so, look, it's, it's possible there's another cyclical boom and bust cycle. Um, you know, our, our, our plan for that cycle would be, basically be to just keep going, uh, keep working with our existing companies, help them through it, keep investing in new companies all the way through, and basically bet on these sort of micro-level fundamental technological and economic changes that continue to happen. It seems as if there are no losses anymore. In the old days, the venture capitalists would say maybe they'd make money on 10% of their deals and they'd lose money on 90%, or that's roughly how people might have looked at it. Now you seem to make money on everything. Does anything ever fail anymore? 
anymore? I can confirm that that is not the case. Uh, <laughs> we, we made a commitment, we, we made this is true, we made a commitment to our investors when we first raised our fund. I said, look, we're, we're going to try to, we're trying to get to the moon, we're trying to do the moon shots. Um, you know, now every once in a while we're going to have rockets blow up in the launch pad and put a big crater in the ground. And so I, I, I am pleased to say we do both of those. Um, the statistical kind of layout of top-end venture capital, um, if you look at like the 50-year history of it, is it's actually about a 50-50 success rate. And this is for kind of top decile venture capital, so kind of, you know, kind of where, where you want to be. But it's basically 50% of the companies make money, 50% of the companies lose money. Um, and then, of course, you need the 50% of the companies that make money to <laughs> make more money than the ones who lose, lose money. Um, and and that's, that's the general statistical breakdown. But it used to be the case if a venture capitalist did a very successful deal, the venture capitalist might make four, ten, 15 times its money, her money, his money. Now you seem to make 500 times your money in some cases. So for example, a deal that your firm did, Coinbase seems to be one of the most successful venture deals of all time. Was that obvious to you when you made the initial investment? No, these are not. Well, so <laughs> we are 100% confident every time we make the investment that it's going to be a big company. Um, we are wrong a lot of the time. Um, you know, it's, it's, these companies are very contingent. Uh, we like to say there's a lot of path dependence in the system. Right? There's a lot of twists and turns along the way. Uh, I, you know, look, a huge part of it is the competence and capabilities of the founders um, and, and then ultimately the CEO of the company. And, of course, they, you know, they deserve 99% of the credit when it works out. Now, historically, venture capitalists used to price deals at, you know, hoping they get a good rate of return. But uh, a firm like uh, SoftBank has come in with enormous amounts of money right. and paid higher prices than I think even you would pay or other venture capitalists. Has that helped the business, hurt the business, or is it too early to say? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a market fundamentalist. Um, I, I, I have great respect for anybody who's fielding money, um, you know, where, they, where, they're, where they're taking responsibility for the results. Um, and I, you know, I, and I don't like to, I don't like to prejudge. Um, I think SoftBank has made some, has made some actually very good investments. Um, I would say sometimes that amount of money is very helpful to a company, which is it really helps them kind of, you know, bootstrap and, and get big and scale. Sometimes too much money is very damaging for a company, right? And it can, it can, you can, you can really kind of screw up a company. Um, and I think that's also happening. Andreessen Horowitz, co-founder Mark Andreessen with David Rubenstein there. You can catch the full interview tonight on the latest episode of Bloomberg Wealth with David Rubenstein, 9 p.m. Eastern. Now, shares of Nikola sinking after the embattled clean energy truck maker cut its delivery forecast for the year. The company reporting a narrower loss than Wall Street expected in the second quarter, but just days after its fallen founder was charged with misleading investors, supply chain problems mean a rethink for Nikola's ambitions this year. Ed Ludlow joins us now with the latest, and you actually spoke to the current CEO uh, who's cleaning this all up or trying to. What did he tell you? Right. It's an extraordinary story where they go through this kind of trauma of, of their founder being charged with criminal and, and SEC charges. Some drama. And then in the background, they're trying to get the company back on track. But the, the long and short of it is they will now only make 25 to 50 trucks this year. They were going to make 50 to 100. What's so amazing and shocked me when I spoke to the CEO is that of those 25 to 50, they won't even be able to sell all of them because they'll be missing parts like semiconductors. Um, and until that they can retrofit them, they're not out able to put them down as revenue. So they'll just give them away for free for testing purposes and hopefully sell some more later. How frank has the CEO been with you about Trevor Milton's behavior? I mean, is he throwing him under the bus or is he defending him? So the company and Mark Russell, the CEO, have been very careful about what they've said, but they've been consistent. So they say this is only about Trevor Milton. The charges only relate to Trevor Milton and the actions that he took and the things that he said on the record, on social media like Twitter and in interviews. But he did say it's hard to draw a line in the sand with this because by association, people will remember the company for this criminal uh, and securities fraud investigation. Right. I mean, do they need a rebrand? It's, it's very hard to, to do a rebrand. You have Wall Street analysts saying that there will be scarring. That was uh, Chris McNally from Evercore, that these executives will have scarring from the experience. But what Mark Russell told me was that there's no judge that makes this all go away for everyone else that was there at the time. You know, he doesn't just hit the gavel, as Mark Russell put it, and then suddenly everybody's cleared. They'll always be associated with what Trevor Milton did. Meantime, it's not all easy in the semi-truck, electric semi-truck space. Tesla has delayed the launch of their semi-truck. Where does that stand? What does that mean for Nikola? Right, so this is really interesting because Tesla has pushed back semi to sometime in 2022. On paper, Nikola will still have a battery electric truck with customers that generates revenue before they do. We're talking about really small volumes, though. They still say that 1,200 trucks, battery electric trucks, is on track for 2022. And then in 2023, they want to launch their fuel cell truck. All of this is still possible. 
the CEO told me, despite the supply chain concerns. And how does concerns. that compare with numbers we might see from Tesla? Tesla, we don't know, because I think the, the thing about Tesla that everyone's a little bit worried about is that it seems as if, according to sources and what's said on earnings calls, Tesla feels like they should prioritize other things ahead of semi-truck, that their thinking is, well, maybe we have a bit off a bit more we can chew. Let's push semi-truck back until we have our own house in order with Model Y, with the factory in Austin and, and in Germany as well. So who are the main customers here? In this market, I mean, this is, a, this is not your typical Model 3, Model S, Model X This customer. is what I loved about covering the story, that you, you had this eccentric founder who was charged with criminal and securities fraud charges, but he made something sexy, which was boring semi-trucks that carry heavy objects from A to B. These are fleet operators, old-school legacy trucking companies. Um, they're breweries who operate you know, big trucks carrying kegs back and forth between the brewery and bars that they sell them to. It's not historically been a dynamic area with technology at the forefront, but they want to make that because there's a really good use case environmentally and cost efficiency wise for doing electric and later fuel cell trucks and, for trucking. And that is quite an adjective ad given the Tesla Model S X. Why spells yes, quite. <laughs> something similar. All right, Ed Ludlow, thank you so much. Uh, we'll continue to watch your reporting on the Nikola story as that unfolds. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure to stick with us tomorrow. Earnings will continue. We're going to have full coverage of Etsy, Uber, Electronic Arts, and more. You won't want to miss it. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.